What we're looking at in short uh, is the role that improved corporate governance can have on helping to rein in powerful CEOs. And in particular, we're focusing on the exact ways in which that might happen. So uh, powerful CEOs have been documented to, to potentially not create value, at least in some contexts. So if you've uh, been following the takeover literature, and I know we've had a couple of presentations on takeovers, our powerful CEOs are documented to be associated with value destruction in takeovers. In part, that can be due to entrenchment and managers acting self-interestedly. In part, it can also be due to them perhaps exerting less effort than would be optimal. That is, a powerful CEO, by becoming entrenched, doesn't need to exercise as much effort as they would otherwise need to do. Uh, so there can be potentially suboptimal investments uh, across myriad fields. Uh, this can lead to overinvestment in takeovers, overinvestment in capex, or potentially if the powerful CEO is investing excessively in safe empire building types of investments, underinvestment in things such as R&D. So the question is then, how could you perhaps mitigate that? How could you perhaps get powerful CEOs to act more in shareholders' best interests, uh, potentially by improving corporate governance? Now, what we focus on is the role of independent directors. Now, independent directors are relevant uh, globally. In the United States, they became relevant around, for example, the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the NICE NASDAQ listing rules. They're also relevant in other countries which don't have those same requirements. And I'll come to the exact requirements we look at in a second. Um, but they're relevant in terms of how you would discipline powerful CEOs. Um, so in particular, we're focusing on the board of directors. Uh, and in particular, we're focusing on independent directors and the extent to which independent directors could engage in additional oversight of powerful CEOs. Now, independent directors are worth focusing on because independent directors are potentially less co-opted by executives. They're potentially more able and more willing to exercise independent oversight of CEOs. They might also force the CEO to consider independent perspectives on how to run the company. That is, they force the CEO to consider fresh perspectives on managing the firm. This can potentially mitigate the impact of having a powerful CEO. Now, the key issue, of course, is that board independence is endogenous. That is, there can be an endogenous link between the extent to which a firm has an independent board and the presence of a powerful CEO especially if that powerful CEO can impact the selection of executives or impact the selection of directors. So in order to get at that, or in order to get around that rather, uh, we focus on the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the simultaneous changes to NICE and NASDAQ listing rules, which basically force firms to have overall a majority independent directors, a fully independent audit, audit committee, fully independent nominating committee. Those are the key provisions we focus on. Now this forces firms to have a greater board independence, and in so doing, it could force firms to have additional oversight of powerful CEOs. Now effectively, what we want to look at is for the firms that didn't already have an independent board, they would be forced to have an independent board after the passage of these acts. So that is, there's a difference in difference type setup here, right? In that you've got a set of firms that didn't previously have an independent board, and those firms needed to come into compliance after the passage of these acts. Uh, or passage these regulations, rather. And then you have the set of firms that already had an independent board. Now, this set of firms didn't need to change their board structure necessarily after the passage of the legislation and after the changes to the listing rules. So you end up with a set of firms that could be affected, a set of firms that might not be affected. Uh, now, this uh, in the United States occurred in 2002 and to a lesser extent 2003. Uh, now, in other countries, they don't have the same types of rules, for example. So other countries don't necessarily mandate board independence, and as a result, other countries might want to look at to what extent, if at all, has this been beneficial. In the United States, there's a continued debate over whether Sarbanes-Oxley Act and these listing rules were beneficial. So this examination helps to feed into whether these changes were actually useful to firms. Uh, and this is particularly uh, a key topic, uh, because there's been papers that have shown that firms have been less uh, interested in listing on the US market following these additional uh, governance changes. And now, in terms of Sarbanes Oxley, some prior literature has shown that it has been beneficial in some specific contexts. So, for example, it has been potentially beneficial in reining in overconfident CEOs. Now, an overconfident CEO is not necessarily a powerful CEO, they're two quite different constructs. Uh, so, it's been beneficial in some contexts in reining in some types of CEOs. We would expect that it might be beneficial, for the reasons I've already indicated, in helping to rein in powerful CEOs as well. 
Um, so uh, that's effectively what we're looking at in, uh, in this paper. Uh, now, as I've indicated before, Sarbanes-Oxley Act affected a subset of firms. It affected the subset of firms that didn't previously have an independent board of directors. This enables us to distinguish between compliant and non-compliant <laughs> firms. That is, the compliant firms were the ones that already had this independent board along the lines I've discussed, and the non-compliant ones were those that didn't have this independent board. Now, for the tests I'm going to report in the, uh, in the presentation, I'm going to focus on the impact of SOX for the non-compliant firms. In additional tests that I'm not presenting just for the uh, purposes of time, we also do a difference in difference uh, test where we're comparing the impact of SOX for compliant versus non-compliant firms with and without powerful CEOs. Uh, now, that's in the, uh, in the paper. I'll focus on the uh, more simple to read uh, slides uh, or tables for this uh, presentation. Uh, so basically our model specification is we focus on effectively S&P 1500 firms and we focus on them between 1990 and 2014. Uh, now the reason we focus on those types of firms is these are the firms for which we can get executive characteristics. Uh, for example, we can get characteristics on uh, CEOs, option compensation and uh, stock compensation. And we can get that from a database called Execucomp. So this gives us a richer data set by looking at the S&P 1500. Uh, there's no reason to suspect the results wouldn't hold in smaller companies. Uh, by looking at the bigger ones, we can get a better access to, better access to data. Now, in terms of how we're measuring uh, CEO power, we're measuring that by effectively constructing uh, index, an index based on uh, several characteristics. So, for example, whether the CEO is a founder, CEO chair duality, title concentration, that is how many titles that CEO has, uh, whether the tenure is above the industry median, and whether the CEO's ownership is above the industry median. Now, each of these individually can capture different constructs, of course. So, for example, CEO tenure in and of itself could capture CEO skill in, a, in terms of being able to maintain their job. Uh, the purpose of having the index, of course, is to try and triangulate factors that will increase CEO power uh, when put together. Uh, we also construct an indicator for whether the CEO's power is in that top quartile. Um, now, in terms of our general specification, uh, we're basically looking at the impact of CEO power uh, as moderated by Sarbanes-Oxley Act on some on various dependent variables. Uh, so I've indicated our general regression framework on the slide here. As I've also talked about, we use a difference in difference uh, type of test to compare compliant versus non-compliant firms. Now, in the slides that I'm going to be focusing on, we're just looking at this model in the set of firms that didn't already comply with Sarbanes-Oxley Act. The reason for that is these are the firms that actually have to make governance changes. So therefore, the, they're the firms that will need to change governance around this 2002 change to regulations. For the firms that were previously compliant, they didn't need to make any changes. You wouldn't expect them to have an impact. Uh, we do test that in other uh, results. So uh, in terms of the key research questions, we're basically looking at, broadly speaking, does an improvement in governance help to reduce the overinvestment that these powerful CEOs might be doing? And by overinvestment, I mean investment in things that don't create corporate value. So that could involve uh, factors such as takeovers that destroy value. And we're going to look at that across multiple contexts, or constructs rather. So uh, the first thing that we really focus on is R&D. Uh, now, as I've indicated, a powerful CEO potentially will underinvest in R&D. The reason they might underinvest in R&D is due to at least one of two reasons. Firstly, a powerful CEO might realize that empire building could be a way to improve their future job prospects. That follows a paper by Harford and Schonlau that shows that basically continued investment in empire building seems to improve your future job prospects whether or not it actually creates value. So empire building could be attractive to a powerful CEO. Now, that would involve investments in things such as capex, investments in things such as takeovers, as opposed to investments in R&D, which might be risky and might have a more uncertain payoff. So we'd expect they might underinvest for that reason. An alternative reason is following Bertrand and Mullen Nathan in 2003. And basically, they find that uh, entrenched CEOs might underinvest in risky investments because they might simply not want to exert the effort that's required. As a function of one of either of these two constructs, you would expect that powerful CEOs might underinvest in R&D. Uh, so the first test we're looking at is the impact of CEO power, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and their interaction on the amount that firms invest in R&D in each year. 
Uh, now, what we would expect is that after sarbanes Oxley Act, for the firms that weren't previously compliant with its provisions, these firms would start to invest more in R&D. That doesn't necessarily tell you that it's value creating, but it tells you they might be investing more in innovation. So that's effectively what we're looking at here. Now, the key thing that's of relevance here is the interaction term between our sarbanes Oxley Act variable, which captures uh, basically just an indicator for the passage of the law with our CEO power variables. And what we would expect is a positive and significant coefficient, which is what we find. As I indicated, that doesn't tell you that there's value creation. So hence we look at after that, is this R&D that might actually be creating innovation outputs, not just investment in innovation inputs. So in order to look at innovation outputs, we also look at several ways that innovation could be beneficial to a firm. And we're looking at not just do they invest more in R&D, but does that have tangible impacts for a firm? So we look at that in terms of patent outputs, uh, citations, and the value of, these, of this innovation. Uh, now, the market value of innovation is obviously a tricky one to get at. It highly correlates with how many citations the patents actually accrue. So in order to get at that, again, we run a similar regression framework, and we're looking at the number of patents the firm has uh, in, t, in year T plus two as a function of, again, CEO power, the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and the interaction thereof. Um, now, in terms of patents and citations, these powerful CEOs after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, they're generating more patents and more citations than they were beforehand. They are also generating, their uh, patents, or rather, uh, are also having a higher market value after Sarbanes-Oxley Act than they were beforehand, suggesting that the R&D that they might be doing seems to be creating more value than it was before which seems to imply that improved governance might be leading not just to improvements in the amount that's invested on innovation inputs, but also an improvement in those innovation outputs, which is a key factor associated with whether R&D is actually creating value. So it isn't necessarily just, um, isn't necessarily just uh, an increase in expenditure, but an increase in the value created by that expenditure. Uh, now that's uh, useful, uh, that's, uh, that has, a key intuition behind it, rather, in that uh, it's, there's a key intuition for why improved governance should improve R&D outputs, or uh, improve innovation outputs. And that can come from the need to consider outside views on whether that R&D will actually create value. It can also come from the increased discipline that will be required when making that R&D investment. So it would appear to create a degree of value for these firms. Um, the next thing, of course, to look at is, in terms of R&D, they might be investing more in R&D. Uh, and as I indicated before, one of the key concerns is that a powerful CEO might overinvest in less innovative investments that create less long-term value. Some of, those innovative in, some of those less innovative investments, rather, could be CapEx growth or PP&E growth, so property, plant, and equipment growth. Those might not create value because they're less innovative they seem to have less correlation to long-term value creation in the firm, and they are potentially a greater source of empire building for these firms. So the question is, could you reduce that expenditure in fixed assets, and as I've indicated, maybe shift it toward R&D, or at least shift it towards something that will create value? So the next test that we're looking at here is after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, do powerful CEOs seem to invest less in CapEx and grow property, plant, and equipment by less than they were beforehand? which would potentially suggest a reduction in empire building. Now, that's effectively what we're finding here with this double interaction term. The uh, powerful CEOs after Sarbanes-Oxley Act seem to, create less, uh, seem to invest less in CapEx, uh, so that the CapEx growth uh, becomes lower, and their PP&E growth also seems to decline. Uh, so that is, they are growing both by less than they were beforehand. And as I sort of alluded to, powerful CEOs as you can kind of see from the coefficient on CEO power by itself, they do seem to be growing CapEx and PP&E more in general, but that reduces after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, suggesting an increase in oversight might help to rein in what they're, what they're spending. Now, that doesn't necessarily tell you there's value creation. That is, it's not necessarily beneficial if they reduce CapEx and reduce PP&E growth, but they aren't uh, shifting that into something that's value creating. Or alternatively, if they just cut back on all investment, that might not generate value. Uh, so the next thing to look at is, in terms of the, uh, the market announcement returns, 
uh, around uh, the market announcement returns around the investments in these new innovations, or new investments rather. So what we've got here is value creation around product announcements, and we're looking at the market's reaction to that value, uh, to those product announcements, uh, in terms of the cumulative abnormal return around the product announcement. And we also look at uh, an indicator for whether that cumulative abnormal return is in the top quartile. Now, if reducing capex is actually beneficial, then you would expect these cars, the cumulative abnormal returns, to get better after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is effectively what we're finding here. Um, after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, powerful CEOs' investment announcements do create more value. We also look at that in terms of acquisitions, and again, we're looking at the cumulative abnormal return around acquisition announcements. Uh, again, if, you, if powerful CEOs are reducing empire building after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, these cars should get better. That is, that would reflect a reduction in empire building, which is exactly what we're finding. Powerful CEOs' takeovers create more value after Sarbanes-Oxley Act than they were before, suggesting, again, a reduction in empire building. Uh, finally, what we look at is if they're, if they're spending less on some of these investments, spending less on CapEx, spending less on PP&E, are they just hoarding that as a cash stockpile, which if you followed uh, Jared Harford's papers, that wouldn't be beneficial, or are they paying it out? And what we're finding here is they are potentially paying it out in the form of dividends. So after Sarbanes-Oxley Act, powerful CEOs seem to, be paying less, uh, seem to be paying more dividends than they were before, suggesting that instead of hoarding cash, they're paying it back to shareholders, which itself is more beneficial than just sitting on a cash stockpile uh, for no necessary corporate reason. So just to summarize this paper, what this paper effectively looks at is powerful CEOs and the extent to which improvements in corporate governance could help to rein in potentially value destruction in powerful CEOs. What we find is that after there's an exogenous shock to board independence, powerful CEOs seem to invest less, but when they're investing, it seems to create more value. They do more innovation, the innovation seems to generate more outputs, and the takeovers seem to create more value when you get this forced improvement in corporate governance.